fitter, happier, more productive, comfortable, not drinking too much, regular exercise at the gym, three days a week, getting on better with your associate employee contemporaries, at ease, eating well, no more microwave dinners and saturated fats, a patient better driver, a safer car, baby smiling in backseat, sleeping well, no bad dreams, no paranoia, careful to all animals, never washing spiders done a plug hole, keep in contact with old friends, enjoy a drink now and then, will frequently check credit at, moral, bank, hole in wall, favors for favors, fond but not in love, charity standing orders, on Sundays reading road supermarket, no killing moths or putting boiling water on the ants, car wash, also on Sundays, no longer afraid of the dark or midday shadows nothing so ridiculously teenage and desperate nothing so childish, at a better pace, slower and more calculated, no chance of escape, now self-employed, concerned, but powerless, an empowered and informed member of society, pragmatism not idealism, will not cry in public, less chance of illness, tires that grip in the wet, shot of baby strapped in backseat, a good memory, still cries at a good film, still kisses with saliva, no longer empty and frantic, like a cat, tied to a stick, that's driven into, frozen winter shit, the ability to laugh at weakness, calm, fitter, healthier, and more productive, a pig, in a cage, on antibiotics. Man, alone on earth, has the capacity for abstract thought and the freedom to choose what to do or think. What he decides to do may be a subjective choice, a matter of personal preference. What he enjoys may be the result of his taste or education. But there are certain cases where there is, like it or not, no choice, where facts are facts and quite inescapable. Here, the computer is man's newest tool. In the Industrial Revolution, machines multiplied the power of his hands. Today, the computer can provide an enormous extension of his mental powers. A man is like a computer. He is programmed by heredity and environment. To the extent that he is creative, he is more than a computer. He is a form of life. but he is much slower, and he makes mistakes. This is a high-speed electronic computer. Like the piano, it too may be programmed with punch tape or cards, or by more advanced devices such as magnetic tape or teletype units talking directly to the computer. Like the man, it too does arithmetic. In fact, in one second, it can do far more arithmetic than the man using a desktop calculator can do in a full year. In one second, the computer can perform more than one million arithmetical operations. And arithmetic is only one outlet for its many talents, performed with electrons moving at nearly the speed of light. A computer can do research, analysis, and business management, can make decisions, can play cards and chess, and even compose and play music, like this. During the 20th century, companies and institutions have grown from simple one-location operations to complex regional, national, and international organizations. The effect of this growth has been an exponential increase in the amount of information these organizations must handle. And too often, reporting systems vary, and information is late or inaccurate. Management recognized the need long ago for a mechanized means of processing all this information. 
They wanted an ideal mechanized system that would pick up information right at the source of activity with perfect accuracy, process it instantly, and then deliver the precise result desired, exactly where it was needed, when it was needed, in whatever form it was needed. Now, man wasn't able to build this ideal system immediately when he first saw he needed it. It had to evolve. When you're talking about superintelligent AI that can make changes to itself, it would seem, it seems that we only have one chance to get the initial conditions right. And even then, we will need to absorb the economic and political consequences of getting them right. Businesses are extremely cagey about talking about their interest in artificial intelligence. Not surprising given that robots or algorithms could replace humans in any number of ways. But the moment we admit that information processing is the source of intelligence, that some appropriate computational system is what the basis of intelligence is, and we admit that we will improve these systems continuously, and we admit that the horizon of cognition very likely far exceeds what we currently know, then we have to admit that we're in the process of building some sort of god. Now would be a good time to make sure it's a god we can live with. Recently, a documentary has come out called Do You Trust This Computer? And it features Elon Musk and Ray Kurzweil and a whole slew of experts on artificial intelligence. And the documentary, of course, is talking about the development of artificial intelligence, uh, the implications for society, outlining many of the uh, potential dangers and ramifications and all this, uh, such as the impact on jobs, the impact on the economy, the impact on... Uh, possible military uses, or the majority of the documentary actually covers a lot of these sort of fearful situations, these downsides that uh, most of you listening would probably um, resonate with. And I'll leave a link below so that you can go watch it. It's free, actually, on their website. And it's very professionally done, whoever produced it. There's a lot of uh, things that I could talk about and go on tangents about, but I just wanted to focus on sort of the punchline to the whole thing, which is the ending. And once again, we see the Hegelian dialectic being applied, whereas the whole movie is setting up the, the problem and provoking the reaction. And then at the end, they give you the solution. And Elon Musk actually absolutely point blank gives us the solution. And, and ultimately what we see is the most blatant, most unapologetic, unfiltered... <laughs> piece of propaganda for the transhumanist message for the Mark of the Beast system that I've probably ever seen because it's done in a documentary form not just in science fiction or whatever but um, they they're just laying it right out there that we are creating some kind of a god and basically we can either make this god evil or this god benevolent and good depending on what we collectively do and depending on whether we merge with the technology whether we augment ourselves otherwise we get left behind uh, and so it's just all right here so i'm just going to play some clips from the end and let it speak for itself Back in 2005, we started trying to build machines with self-awareness. This robot, to begin with, didn't know what it was. All he knew is that it needed to do something like walk. Through trial and error, it figured out how to walk using its imagination, and then it walked away. And then we did something very cruel. We chopped off a leg and watched what happened. In the beginning, it didn't quite know what had happened. But over about a period of a day, it then began to limp. And then a year ago, 
we were training an AI system for a live demonstration. We wanted to show how we wave all these objects in front of the camera and the AI can recognize the objects. And so we're preparing this demo and we had on the side screen this ability to watch what certain neurons were responding to. And suddenly we noticed that one of the neurons was tracking faces. It was tracking our faces as we were moving around. Now the spooky thing about this is that we never trained the system to recognize human faces. And yet, somehow, it learned to do that. Even though these robots are very simple, we can see there's something else going on there. It's not just programmed. So this is just the beginning. I often think about that beach in Kitty Hawk, the 1903 flight by Orville and Wilbur Wright. It was a kind of a canvas plane and some wood and iron, and it gets off the ground for, what, a minute and 20 seconds in this windy day before touching back down again. And it was just around 65 summers or so after that moment that you have a 747 taking off from JFK. Where a major concern of someone on the airplane might be whether or not their salt-free diet meal is going to be coming to them or not. With a whole infrastructure, with travel agents and tower control, and it's all casual, and it's all part of the world. Right now, as far as we've come with machines that think and solve problems, we're at Kitty Hawk now. We're in the wind. We have our, our tattered canvas planes up in the air. But what happens in 65 summers or so, we will have machines that are beyond human control. Should we worry about that? I'm not sure it's going to help. We are training deep learning networks to infer intimate traits, people's political views, personality, intelligence, sexual orientation, just from an image of someone's face. Now think about countries which are not so free and open-minded. If you can reveal people's religious views or political views or sexual orientation based on only profile pictures, this could be literally an issue of life and death. I think there's no going back. Do you know what the Turing test is? It's when a human interacts with a computer. And if the human doesn't know they're interacting with a computer, the test is passed. And over the next few days, you're going to be the human component in the Turing test. Holy shit. Yeah, that's right, Caleb. You got it. Because if that test is passed, you are dead center of the greatest scientific event in the history of man. If you've created a conscious machine, it's not the history of man. That's the history of gods. It's almost like technology is a god in of itself. Like the weather, we can't impact it, we can't slow it down, we can't stop it. We feel powerless. If we think of God as an unlimited amount of intelligence, uh, the closest we can get to that is by evolving our own intelligence, by merging with the artificial intelligence we're creating. Today, our computers, phones, applications give us superhuman capability. So as the old maxim says, like, if you can't beat them, join them. It's about a human-machine partnership. I mean, we already see how, you know, our phones, for example, it's act as memory prosthesis, right? I don't have to remember your phone number anymore because it's on my phone. It's about machines augmenting our human abilities as opposed to, like, completely displacing them. If you look at all the objects that have made the leap from analog to digital over the last 20 years, it's a lot. We're the last analog 
object in a digital universe. And the problem with that, of course, is that the data input-output is very limited. It's this, it's these. Our eyes are pretty good. We're able to take in a lot of visual information. But our information output is very, very, very low. The reason this is important if we envision a scenario where AI is playing a more prominent role in societies, we want good ways to interact with this technology so that it ends up augmenting us. I think it's incredibly important that AI not be other. It must be us. And I could be wrong about what I'm saying. I'm certainly open to ideas if anybody can suggest a, a path that's better. But I think we're really going to have to either merge with AI or be left behind. It's hard to kind of think of unplugging a system that's distributed everywhere on the planet, that's distributed now across the solar system. You can't just, you know, shut that off. We've opened Pandora's box. We've unleashed forces that we can't control, we can't stop. We're in the midst of essentially creating a new life form on Earth. We don't know what happens next. We don't know what shape the intellect of a machine will be when that intellect is far beyond human capabilities. It's just not something that's possible. The least scary future I can think of is one where we have at least democratized AI. Because if one company or small group of people manages to develop godlike digital superintelligence, they could take over the world. At least when there's an evil dictator, that human is going to die. But for an AI, there would be no death. It would live forever. And then you'd have an immortal dictator from which we can never escape.